Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. And this is another Jots and Tittles episode in which I'm going to conduct a short interview uh, with uh, someone that I've uh, been with here on this trip to London for the Trinitarian Bible Society's annual general meeting and the Text and Translation Conference. And if you hear noise outside, it's because we are in a car and we are heading to Heathrow Airport for me to depart for Virginia. And my driver is Jonathan Arnold, who is the General Secretary of the TBS. So Jonathan, welcome to this uh, podcast interview. Thank you, Jeff. It's uh, good to speak with you. I see that as the General Secretary, uh, you take on all the really important jobs, like being a chauffeur for, for visitors uh, to TBS. Is Indeed. that right? Yeah, that's right. You get all the glamour <laughs> positions. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Jonathan, uh, you are serving as the General Secretary. Uh, how long have you been in this position for the Trinitarian Bible Society? So I took up this position in January this year, um, following a, a short period where the Society didn't have a General Secretary. The, the previous uh, General Secretary was uh, Mr. Paul Rowland, who, who retired um, and is now uh, the sort of President of the Society, which is... Uh, one uh, a role that uh, we're very thankful he continues in and continues to pray uh, for our work but I began in January prior to that I was editorial director at the society for um, probably around four four and a half years and before that I worked as the editorial manager okay so you've got it you've had a pretty long history with TBS in and so if you were to, if you were to meet someone um, you know, who didn't have any idea what the Trinitarian Bible Society is, and they said, uh, "So, Jonathan, you work. You're the general secretary for TBS. What is TBS? What does it do? How would you respond to that?" I think I'd respond uh, by pointing out three things in the history of the TBS. So, before Trinitarian Bible Society was formed, it was part of what used to be known as the British or Foreign Bible Society. And, and that began with, uh, with a young lady called Mary Jones, who some may have heard about, um, who was after a Bible. And uh, to cut a long story short, she walked across a long way across the Welsh mountains and um, went and received a Bible. And the minister at that time was so moved. Um, he was uh, desirous to create an organization uh, that would be able to distribute the scriptures. Uh, moving on from that, in 1831, uh, the associations of uh, that society had, had begun to include Unitarians, and uh, they'd also permitted the Apocrypha to be published alongside the scriptures. And so a group, inc including uh, men such as Robert Haldane, uh, felt this was incorrect and prayer wasn't held anymore at the meeting to avoid offending Unitarians and so a group separated and that is what formed the Trinitarian Bible Society. So we, our great desire is distributing as you find with Mary Jones also this function of upholding, upholding the Trinity and we're called the Trinitarian Bible Society and likewise upholding the Word of God and in around 1902 as uh, various new English translations were being considered at that time and the development of a new Greek text was being made uh, the society made a stand for the received text and uh, wrote various articles uh, to, to set out clearly its position and the dangers of going down this uh, critical text route uh, which would end up in an ever-changing Bible. Uh, that is, broadly speaking, out of our history, how I would uh, describe our work uh, today. Uh, we have branches in much of the English-speaking world, in Canada, Australia, um, New Zealand, and the USA. And we also have a branch in Brazil. And likewise, uh, we, we continue to uh, distribute the Word of God through hundreds of nations uh, throughout the world. Hmm. You, you were saying uh, that in the 19th century, well, I mean, it's interesting, you know, the name, Trinitarian Bible Society. Right. So 
it's sort of throwing down the gauntlet for Orthodox Christianity, as you said, when there was a, there was a, a failure to draw a distinction between Trinitarianism and, and Unitarianism. I also find it fascinating, though, that in the 19th century, when many people were caught up in the wave of uh, the modern critical text, I mean, even some people, we can see the influence in someone like Spurgeon, who was sort of influenced a bit, maybe was thinking it through, and I know sometimes he's quoted on both sides, but there were men at that time who had the foresight to see the problems that would emerge with the modern critical text. So it's pretty, pretty uh, amazing that they were able to have that foresight. And it's also interesting that it seems to me that the TBS doesn't seem like it's wavered in the last uh, century in sort of holding to that. Indeed, yeah. It, as far as I can tell from, from my knowledge historically and things that I read, the, the TBS and um, the, the successive committees have continued their stand uh, for the received text and uh, also the Hebrew Masoretic, uh, which uh, they had contact with other men such as uh, Ginsberg, who, who were uh, looking at various matters on the Hebrew as well. Mm. So, um, Paul Rowland was your predecessor. How long had he, had he been the executive, or uh, the general secretary? So he'd been there over 30 years, um, probably even close, uh, and I've maybe even underestimated the time he was there. He labored for many years and uh, many people will be aware of him. Um, I, it was my privilege to be able to travel with him in uh, numerous things for the society and um, he labored tirelessly really uh, for the work. I noticed it seemed at the meeting uh, this, this past week that there seemed to be a lot of uh, admiration for him. Indeed. And uh, so, so do you know how, how many previous general secretaries have there been since the founding of the society? That's a good question. I, I must confess, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't know how how many what what um what number I am in the line of uh, general secretaries, but a fair few. But typically, uh, they they remain for a reasonable period of time. And you're a young man, um, and are do you? Do you foresee that you'll be in this position, if God should will, for a long time? Well, Lord willing, if the Lord grants strength and uh, the, the committee here are content for me to continue in that work, it's my privilege, really, to lead this great work that has so many people who are laboring to translate the Word of God, to make a stand for the providentially preserved Word of God, and those who are volunteering, and even people who we may not know personally who take our articles and uh, pass them to others to inform them about something that is just swallowed wholesale uh, through many seminaries promoting this critical text or the eclectic uh, text which is so common today. Mm. So you were talking about the Trinitarian Bible Society having these uh, organizations that are located in other places like in the United States is where it's centered in Grand Rapids uh, you've got your you've got your uh, your offices and a warehouse location in London uh, in the Wimbledon area um, how many people are on the staff who are working in London so in London including uh, volunteers uh, we would have probably around uh, 15 staff but if you include people working remotely and it goes up to 20 and then if you include all our translators uh, across the world we're looking at 80 maybe even more than that and you, and you just had um, and I had the privilege of attending on Saturday September 17 the 2022 uh, annual general meeting that was held at Metropolitan Tabernacle uh, you guys do that every fall, is it every third Saturday in September? Right, every third Saturday in September, and uh, this one was the 191st. Wow. You guys, nine years from now, you're going to have a big 200th anniversary celebration, I'm guessing. We hope so. Yes. Yeah. So, what's the purpose of that meeting? So, the purpose of that meeting is, uh, firstly, to deal with the business of the society, uh, whereby... Um, 
members come along and uh, vote on the on the committee that is forms part of uh, the oversight of TBS. Uh, it also has various approvals. Our accounts and finances are are sent out and are even set out for people to see online should they want to go um, and look at those. And likewise, all the very uh, sort of practical matters of appointing our auditor. We have independent auditors um, that come in and assess our work every year. And then uh, lastly, there's a series of reports from myself um, and the three, uh, three directors, the resources director, operations director, and editorial director, really setting out some aspects of the work in the past year. And uh, this year, uh, from, from my perspective, just uh, re-emphasizing the fact that we're continuing in the stand that we have for many years, even though I'm a new general secretary, uh, we want to stand on the shoulders of others um, who have gone before us. Yeah, I, I, I made the observation to you and some of the other folk, uh, this was the first time I'd been able to attend the meeting, the annual general meeting. Just, I was impressed with the seriousness of it, the sobriety of it, also the transparency, um, you know, as far as fiscal accountability, like you said, there's an outside auditor who examines the financial aspects of the organization. It just seems to be uh, a, a, an organization that's run with a lot of, um, I don't know, maybe it's a typical British skill and organization uh, and transparency that really is admirable. There are some other organizations that would, that would have similar things. Um, and, and uh, I mean, TBS was formed from, from the sort of start over people, ministers and laymen, making a stand for the truth of God's word. And um, the, the previous organization had got into a whole difficulty where individuals were having uh, an influence that was damaging, shall we say, to, to the work. And, and I'm sure these things are in place to avoid that. All right. You, see, you mentioned the, the, the three directors uh, who work with you, and you said there's a resource director, yeah. and that is, that's David? Yeah, that's a man, uh, Mr. David Broom, who uh, would be an accountant by trade, um, and uh, he oversees the resources, so anything from finance, IT, um, the sort of building arrangements, that, that whole sort of area is overseen by David. And the operations director? Yeah, so the operations director is Mr. Philip Blows. He would oversee the sales and, and grants area of the work and the warehouse, which uh, sends the scriptures across the world. And then lastly, the editorial director. Right, so uh, Math Mr. Matthew Vogan, he, he came in uh, earlier this year. We're very grateful to the Lord for him. Um, prior to that, he was a serving member of our committee and uh, he, he labours on the editorial aspects which pretty much consists of everything the society publishes um, except for Portuguese where Brazil uh, leads on that and so the Bibles, the translations, the articles are all part of the editorial work here in London. Right. It seems like just being around the office a little bit, there. There seem to be uh, a good number of young people who are stepping into some of these staffing positions. So is there, has there been kind of a transition kind of going on? I mean, you're coming in as a younger man, as the, the new general secretary. I, I, it seems to me, just an outsider observation, that people seem to serve a long time. Right. And then, there, but there seem to be now some younger faces yep. taking in some of those positions. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, I mean, we, we have some very dear people who have labored for many years, many of you will have seen um, uh, Deborah Anderson and George Anderson who have written various articles that uh, people use and uh, they labor for the society for many, many years. Um, likewise, uh, we have other individuals who've worked in facilities for, uh, for 30, 40 years and finance and uh, they've now got to a stage where they're in their, you know, mid 60s maybe even getting close to 70 and the Lord's led them to to retire 
and one of our great challenges is to retain some things that are in their mind and head and their experience mm. to pass on to those who who are coming in to take up uh, these other roles as well and uh, we've been thankful to the Lord for the provision uh, sometimes the society is looking uh, for people who are supportive of our principles and so uh, the group of individuals is not large that we're we're looking for uh, but we're very grateful that the Lord has, has supplied thus far one of the interesting things for me was also to see some of the um, the recent translation works uh, so at the at the annual general meeting you had a group of people who were there who worked on this the new Spanish translation yeah. there are a group of uh, folk there who were working on the new French translation and then I sat in just yesterday in a zoom meeting uh, where you were talking with uh, two uh, Chinese men who are working on a, a Chinese translation so G give us an update on um, the TBS and what what's happening. What, what are the newest projects that you're working on? Sure. So over the next two years, we have a number of projects that are come, either coming to conclusion or um, they're completing their work on the New Testament. You mentioned the Spanish. That is a work um, on the Reina Valera Bible. Um, and unlike English, um, where the authorized version continues to be uh, in the top three Bibles purchased every single year, the pervading use of the Reign of Valera is the 1960, uh, which has critical text issues and translational issues, and even the 1909 still has some critical text readings in there. So uh, we've had a work to to produce a translation that could be used that would be received text and also uh, one that is usable for those in Latin America and they've been laboring on that for many years and Lord willing uh, they will complete their work in the latter part of this year and we hope to publish the whole Bible next year and we're re really encouraged about that we're told uh, there's a great interest in Latin America right now in a uh, reform theology as well and uh, we're able to uh, couple that with a sound doctrine of scripture that respects the inspired word of God mm. in terms of the other areas we you mentioned the Chinese um, the Chinese Union version uh, whilst we we highly uh, respect it because it's been the translation that many Chinese believers as you have used in their persecution and uh, we want to give due regard to that it continues to be based on uh, the critical text and uh, its translation some say it was even translated from English into Chinese and so it's it's uh, correlation to the Greek is very problematic in a number of places so we've uh, sought to produce a translation that would be sound based on the received text and also one that would be a firm foundation for doctrine in helping uh, those brothers and sisters in China as they seek to uh, found their, their churches on, on the sound doctrine of the Word of God. And then lastly the French, uh, we are working on a translation uh, that we believe comes in the line of Geneva Bibles, the Geneva Bible which is so linked to the Calvin and uh, Calvin's relative Oliver Tan uh, also worked heavily on a French translation that then pulled through to um, a translation that was made in Lausanne in uh, the ninth in the 19th century and uh, this translation is one that was made by men such as um, such as Louis Gosson who is done his work on the inspiration of scripture and uh, some of the Monod brothers as well and again unlike English uh, French uh, the pervading French translation is the Louis Sagon and uh, there have been efforts to uh, refine that to a TR a TBS tried to do that for many years but he he had no respect for the inspiration of scripture and so you find that comes through very strongly in his translation and so we hope that this translation we're producing is founded 
on the sound principles uh, going way back to the Genevan Bible and uh, we trust that we'll be able to uh, supply that to the French speaking people. I, I should have mentioned also that Pastor Pouillon gave a report at the Texan Translation Conference on the uh, completion of the Farsi uh, Persian uh, 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 New Testament as well. Yep. And one, one of the things I thought was interesting about that, he was talking about the uh, the labors of Henry Martin. Yep. I think it was in 1812, uh, who, was, who was the first to translate the New Testament uh, from Greek into Persian. And uh, he was just talking about, uh, and of course, Puyan is originally from Iran too, how the, the, Bible, the, the translation of the Bible uh, into Persian played a role in standardizing the Persian language. Yep. And that's what seems to happen so often with the spread of Christianity, the translating of the scriptures. It has a leavening uh, influence on society. Of course, the key thing is, is the spreading of the gospel. Yep. But it also has a, uh, an, an, an impact of improving uh, society, I think, wherever it goes. So it was just an interesting reminder of that. How and how into how many languages? In how many languages does the TBS uh, distribute scriptures? So right now, I th we would be around eighteen languages, mm -hmm. um, but we're laboring in uh, for around forty or so uh, languages right now. Um, so some of those as we've already mentioned we have new testaments in so they won't be new languages that we publish in but there are others that will be uh, completely new it's interesting you mention sort of standardizing the language we we have uh, some projects uh, where that is even going on today there's a language called uh, desari tharu um, which including its sub sub dialects has about 1.7 million speakers in a region not too far around Nepal and uh, the the Bible that we're working on is likely to be the first major work as I understand it in that language. Wow, wow. So, you know, some people uh, because of the TBS's advocacy among English speakers for the authorized version sometimes they might have the sense of oh, you're just doing these translations from the King James Version, right. uh, but, but what's your response to that? How do you clarify that? So we would always try to translate from the original Greek and Hebrew. It, it, was also, it is obviously wise for someone um, who understands other languages to, to consult and have a look at uh, other, I would say, literal translations um, to help them, but our great desire is to translate from the Greek and Hebrew. And that would, what, there's, there's a couple of occasions where we translated from the English, but that is only because there's no one who can understand Greek and Hebrew at that time. And where that is the case, we see that as a temporary building block to then, Lord willing, in the future, the Lord supplying someone who understands Greek and Hebrew who can then produce a sort of updated translation. On the other hand, you guys have, from the beginning, held doggedly in English to the authorized version. Indeed. Why, why so doggedly? Well, I think, for, first of all, at the time TBS was formed, in 1831, there was no debate. The authorized version was the translation that was used and regarded, and it was only post West God and Hort and the new uh, Greek and then the revised version and that th there became this momentum uh, to change the authorized version and what can we say has resulted mass confusion I mean I, I had contact with someone just recently who was telling me there's now over a, they estimate well over a hundred different translations in English of all different sorts and uh, Many of them, the majority of them, wouldn't even be based on the received text or have any uh, literal or formal equivalence principles, uh, in effect resulting in what the translator thinks uh, the, the Greek writers were trying to say rather than um, as, as literal as possible translation of the Word of God. Uh, likewise, 
our stand for the authorized version is because we believe it is a faithful and accurate translation. Uh, some argue, well, it has some older words, etc. But to take a little work to understand the Word of God it is surely better where, uh, than us gradually reducing its level of literacy uh, to the extent that the doctrine becomes watered down. Mm. Uh, and we hope uh, that as we continue to maintain that, it might be uh, it might be pleasing to the Lord. I mean, in, in these days, I would also say in English, unlike French, uh, for the most part, unlike Spanish, and definitely unlike Portuguese, we don't have a established body that oversees our structure of the English language. I mean, me and you, Jeff, will disagree over the spelling of uh, particular words, and uh, the church is massively disparate. And so, whereas that's not the case, likewise, the authorized version has continued to be the a version that is pretty much the highest sold and desired around the world. And uh, this argument that people can't understand it is really a reflection on the laziness of the individual more than uh, the translation. Right. It was interesting. Uh, the Queen's funeral was on Monday. And uh, what did they read from? The authorized version. Uh, when you think of classic Christianity, uh, of course, I think that the Queen probably had stipulated that the readings be from the authorized version. But uh, it was it was great to hear the cadences of, of that great translation. Well, brother, we're drawing closer to the airport, and I yeah. better let you be able to concentrate on driving so that, so, so that we don't uh, get in an accident here. But anyway, Jonathan, thank you so much for this interview. Thank you for your hospitality over this past week. Well, it's been a joy for you to visit us, Jeff. Right. I'm going to bring this interview to a, a close. I hope this has been profitable, encouraging for those who are listening. I'll look forward to speaking to you in the next episode of this podcast. Till then, take care and God bless.